We're going to be covering the stiffness method applied to frames. We're going to do this by example, and the video is actually going to be divided into two parts. In this first part, we'll look at the problem setup, how to set up the stiffness matrix, how to set up the load vector, and how to calculate the vector of displacements. In this example, we have a one-story, one-bay frame. It's 25 feet wide by 12 feet high. There's a 1.2 kip force applied at the top. The members and joints are labeled by numbers and letters respectively. And the degrees of freedom are shown with blue arrows. Degree of freedom 1 is a translation of the top story. Degree of freedom 2 is a rotation at node B. Degree of freedom 3 is a rotation at node C. Here, we're taking advantage of axial rigidity in the members to reduce the number of degrees of freedom, as well as the fact that ends A and D of the structure are moment-free ends. We have given values of modulus and moment of inertia, and our task is to find the deflection at the top, the reactions, and the moment diagram. As a note here, there are easier ways to solve this than to use the stiffness method. We're using the stiffness method to illustrate the method. Uh, the quickest way to solve this is by arguing from symmetry that the 1.2 kip load at the top divides out evenly to A and D, 0 0.6 kips at A and D, and from there everything else can be solved using statics. Having said that, let's begin the problem. We'll do this worksheet three times, one time for each degree of freedom. And what I'm going to show each time is the undeformed shape of the structure, and then free bodies that will go fill out little by little that show each of the members, as well as the two adjoining nodes. I'm showing the degrees of freedom in double arrows, just to keep the arrows clear, and I'm also indicating right here by a dash double line that degree of freedom 1 engages the entire top story. So if I pull this node to the right, because of the axial rigidity of this member, I'm also going to pull this node to the right. Let's get started. First, we'll keep in mind our deformed shape. The deformed shape is a rightward translation with the nodes not rotating. This is the corresponding deformed shape. And this is my starting point for determining the member forces. On each of the columns, there must be a moment acting in this direction to impose the curvature that's shown on the column. This moment is causing a counterclockwise rotation, so the corresponding shears must cause a clockwise rotation. What are the values of these? Well, we'll flip out our trusty appendix, and we have right here moment free end, a translation, the moment is 3EI over L squared, the shears are 3EI over L cubed. I'm going to label these M0 and V0. and we'll indicate that M0 is equal to 3 EI over H squared. V0 is equal to 3 EI over H cubed. You'll notice that I'm using H because H is this vertical dimension right here, so I'm not just plugging in blindly to the values in the table. Our next task is going to be to react these forces equal and opposite onto the nodes above. V0 and M0 and V0 and M0 over here. Now we're ready to establish three elements of the stiffness matrix. Remember that Kij is the force at degree of freedom I due to a unit displacement at degree of freedom J. So K11 
Here's the force along degree of freedom 1 due to this displacement at degree of freedom 1. And I'm picking up two V0s here. Remember that due to the axial rigidity of this member, these two, for, these two nodes are connected to each other. They move as a unit. K21 is the force on degree of freedom 2 due to this displacement on degree of freedom 1. Here's the M0 right here. K31 is the force on degree of freedom 3 due to this displacement on U1, M0. Let's just pay attention to the signs. The signs are positive if the force is opposite to the degree of freedom. So degree of freedom is rightward. These are leftward, positive. The degree of freedom is counterclockwise. This is clockwise, positive. Same argument here. So these are the stiffness values that we're looking for. The last thing I want to keep in mind is just to keep track of our displacements. This here is U1, and we do need to keep track of this angle here when it comes time to force recovery. And we'll just note here that U4 is equal to 3 U1 over 2H. And this is uh, something that occurs because we're omitting to consider the degrees of freedom here. We're considering them as moment-free ends. The difficulty is we need to keep track of what this rotation is that gets caused. That ends degree of freedom 1. Degrees of freedom 2 and 3 will be slightly more complicated. Let's start again by drawing the deformed shape. Degree of freedom 2 is a <coughs> rotation of this node here. The column deforms with the moment free bottom, but the beam deforms with the fixed end over here at the other node that hasn't rotated. This column remains vertical. What do the member forces look like? Let's start by looking at the members themselves. Here we have a moment on the column, moments on the beam. Now there's a moment at this end because it's a fixed end. This moment is acting counterclockwise, so the shears must act clockwise. Similarly here, the moments are acting counterclockwise, so the shear must act clockwise. And let's, let's figure out what the values are here. For the column, we have a rotation with the moment free end. The moment is 3EI over L, and the shear is 3EI over L squared. So let's account for that. We'll call this moment 1, and this shear 1 and shear 1, and we have that moment 1 is equal to 3EI over L, and shear 1 is equal to 3EI over L squared. And we need to be careful, those aren't L's. Those are H's because the length of this member is the height of the structure. Over here, we now have to look at the other term in the table. We have fixed, fixed, there's a rotation at this end. The moment at the location of the rotation is 4EI over L. The moment on the other end is 2EI over L. And the shears are 6EI over L squared. Now we actually are using the L. We'll call these M2, M3, and V2, where M2 is on the node that's being rotated, so that's 4 EI over L. M3 is on the other side, 2 EI over L. And V2 is 6 EI over L squared. Now we need to react these onto the degrees of freedom. Let's first consider these forces on the column. So M1 and V1 are equal and opposite. And let's consider the moments reacting onto the nodes. M2 
and M3. Now these shears also react, but what we need to keep in mind is that there's no degree of freedom to restrain those nodes. Rather, that's accounted for by the axial rigidity of the member, so we have to react that all the way down to the foundation. And it gets a bit messy, right? But here we have V2, 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 and V2. So this is our full free body diagram. Um, I like to tell my students that no matter how much space you think you've left yourself, you never leave yourself enough space. And indeed, that's what I've done. This V2 right here looks pretty, pretty unclear, and I apologize for that. We're now ready to get our next three terms in this stiffness matrix. So K12 is the force along degree of freedom 1 due to this displacement that we're showing here. And the only horizontal force on degree of freedom 1 is V1. K22 is the moment at degree of freedom 2. That's M1 and M2. And the K32 is the moment on degree of freedom 3. That's M3. You'll notice that in all of these cases, the forces are going opposite to the degree of freedom. So our signs are all positive here. Lastly, we'll just keep track of our displacements here. This is U2, the actual rotation of the degree of freedom. And down here, we need to keep track of this uh, rotation here, which we've seen previously is equal to half the rotation that we've imposed. Again, we'll keep track of this for use in force recovery. Now, let's move to degree of freedom 3. The procedure in degree of freedom 3 is exactly the same as degree of freedom 2. We just need to go about doing it. Degree of freedom 3 is a rotation of this node. The node over here remains uh, unrotated, undisplaced, so that column is straight. This column deforms like that. This beam comes back in at a flat angle. We'll move on to identifying the forces that uh, act on each member, the moment, and the shears, as we've argued before. The moments, again, acting in this direction, so the shears must act in the other direction. We actually use the same diagrams as before. So for the beam, we're going to use this same diagram right here. And for the column, we're going to use this same diagram right here. So these actually have the same values as before. This is going to be M2, M3, V2. This is going to be M1 and V1. Just the same as in the previous degree of freedom only that now they're on different locations on the structure. Again, we'll look at the equal and opposite reactions first for the moment. M2 from the beam. M1 from the column. M3 from the beam. We'll look at the shear, V1 right here, from the column. And here we have V2 that comes all the way down to the foundation. And here we have V2 that comes all the way down to the foundation. Once again, we'll keep track now of the K13 the force at degree of freedom 1 due to this rotation now at degree of freedom 3. 
that's equal to the force right here. There's no other force here. V1, it's opposite to the degree of freedom, so it's positive. K23 is the moment over here. M3, opposite to the degree of freedom, so it's positive. K33 is the moment over here. M1 plus M2, opposite to the degree of freedom, so it's positive. Lastly, we'll keep track of our displacements. Rotation over here, U3. And this will be U6, where U6 is equal to half of U3. So now we have all three of our degrees of freedom, all nine of the values of our stiffness matrix. The next step is looking at the load vector. For the load vector, I won't do it by hand. We see in this diagram here the same sort of sketch with the degrees of freedom shown in blue. The applied load shown exactly where it's applied on the structure. And that's enough information. We don't have any member loads to account for. So that's enough information to determine our load vector. The load vector is the force, the first element of the load vector is the force along degree of freedom one. That's 1.2 kips. There's no moments at degree of freedom two or three, so those are just zeros. Uh, the sign is positive if it's in the direction of the degree of freedom, so P1 carries a positive sign. So the load vector is pretty straightforward. And now we're ready to solve the problem. I'm going to perform my numerical computations in MATLAB. And I'm showing here the previous results from the hand calculations for the elements of the stiffness matrix. I can declare in MATLAB my input values, modulus, moment of inertia, the length and the height, uh, define EI, and the force of 1.2 kips. I can define all the intermediate values, M0, M1, M2, M3, uh, V0. Annoyingly, it appears that I called the uh, values V1 and V2. I called them F1 and F2 in, in my code and uh, we'll define the arrays. You can see how each column of the stiffness matrix corresponds to the column up there on previous results. We can define our load vector. Uh, the semicolons here means that each element is another column down and it just has the value of f of 1.2 kips. Uh, one thing that I failed to mention is that the entire calculation is in consistent units of kips and inches. So you'll notice that there's nothing here except for simply translating the work that I already did into something that the, the computer can calculate. So th there's no real difficult intellectual work here. It's just slightly tedious uh, computational work. And lastly, we can solve for you this, this syntax that we use to solve the system of equations in MATLAB. And when we do that, we get the following answer. The first element is going to be the horizontal displacement of the structure in inches, because that's our consistent unit. The other two are going to be the node rotations at B and C in radians. This ends the first part of the video, the setup of the stiffness matrix, the setup of the load vector, and then the calculation for you. If you recall, we were looking for the displacement at the top, the reactions, and the moment diagram. Well, we do actually have one of those values already. U1, the first element of the U vector, is the displacement at the top. So we can say that the displacement at the top of this is uh, 2.7 inches. We found one of the values that we were looking for already. This is one of the nice uh, features of the stiffness method is that the primary values that come out of it are the displacements and those are often important values, so we can get those directly instead of having to do a more roundabout way of getting them. We'll finish this problem in a subsequent video, so stay tuned.